Uh, let me welcome all of you today to our Peterson Institute for International Economics to talk about a set of issues that we think will maybe even push the global crisis aside or at least dent its uh, predominance a bit in the international discussion over the coming months and probably years, namely the evolution of a new international regime to deal with climate change, and particularly in this case, its relationship to the global trading system. Um, I think it is clear that the Copenhagen process and all that goes into that uh, will lead to the creation of a new multilateral system to deal with global warming. And it's our guess here at the Institute that that will be one of the main changes in the global architecture, literally since the creation of the UN system and the Bretton Woods system at the end of the Second World War. And that alone is enough reason for us to give it a lot of attention here as we have been doing. But in addition comes the critical linkage between whatever happens on climate change by way of a new international regime, including, of course, national policies, and the global trading system. It's become increasingly clear that any decisions that are made either nationally or internationally on climate change will have to have a major trade dimension. Um, Gary Huffbauer, the co-author of this book, uh, testified to two of our Senate committees last summer when they were debating this issue before that short floor debate on climate change. And Gary reported that 80% of the testimony had nothing to do with carbon emissions and everything to do with level playing fields and competitiveness concerns for American industry if we put restraints on carbon emissions and other countries do not act comparably. Uh, that led to a study, in fact, that we did and published last year called Leveling the Carbon Playing Field by Trevor Hauser and several colleagues from World Resources Institute, WRI, with which we have worked very closely on all of our work in this area. Uh, but then comes the international dimension and the critical question of the interrelationship between whatever happens on climate change and the global trading system. Are there ways that those two regimes can be made compatible with each other? Are there inevitable tensions and even conflicts between them as the climate change negotiations go forward? How can we best achieve the goals of the climate change effort to significantly reduce the risks to the planet, while at the same time, at a minimum, not disrupting the global trading system, and indeed, even perhaps finding new positive ways to promote its future evolution, uh, increase the openness for trade in goods that are directly related to dealing with climate change, energy and environmental goods and services trade. Um, how can these two big areas of the world economy be uh, interlinked and made not just compatible, but hopefully mutually supportive? That big task, big intellectually and analytically, as well as politically, is the topic of the book that we very proudly released today, Global Warming and the World Trading System. It's been uh, written by uh, senior fellow Gary Huffbauer here at the Institute, uh, Steve Chornovitz, our very close friend and colleague for many years who teaches at the uh, George Washington University Law School, and Jason Kim, uh, who is a research associate here at the Institute. Uh, most of you know Gary Huffbauer. Uh, he's been a senior fellow here at the Institute off and on, but mainly on, since the creation of the Institute back in 1981. Uh, he was formerly my Deputy Assistant Secretary at the Treasury in charge of trade and investment issues, and prior to that, head of the international tax part of the Treasury. Uh, Gary has produced a literally awesome array of work over his career uh, on trade issues, investment, tax issues, um, one of the pioneers of studies of NAFTA, free trade agreements, the whole range of U.S. international economic uh, activities, and now he extends his work into this nexus between climate change and trade. Uh, Steve Charnovitz uh, is Associate Professor of Law at GW. Uh, he had a long and distinguished career uh, 
on the staff of the uh, Congress as legislative assistant to two speakers of the House, uh, Jim Wright and Tom Foley. He then was policy director of the U.S. Competitiveness Policy Council that I had the honor of uh, chairing back in the early 1990s. He practiced law for six years at Wilmer Hale and has been on the faculty of the GW Law School uh, for the last five years. Uh, Jason Kim is a research assistant working closely with Gary here at the Institute, and she has co-authored several of his earlier works on U.S. competitiveness, international competition policy, and international tax issues. Finally, before turning to the authors, I want to thank the people who made this study possible, i.e., those who funded it. Uh, and I'm delighted that we have today two representatives here from the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, Andrew Bowman, Katie Donnelly, uh, whose very generous support has uh, literally enabled us to devote a lot of our attention at the Institute in this area. We've also had significant support from some major corporations, uh, Cargill, Debbie Buffner is here with us today, uh, Chevron, Caterpillar have helped us in this area as well. Uh, as I think it's fair to say, all parts of U.S. society gear up and try to prepare for the attack on the global warming problem, which is, uh, to be sure, one of the most daunting and most critical problems facing our nation and the world as we enter the 21st century. So today, we address the trade dimension of it at the international level, and I'll turn to our authors, Gary Huffbauer, Steve Charnovitz, and Jason Kim. Gary. Well, Fred, thanks very much, and thanks to everybody who's come uh, today uh, to uh, share in this launching with us. I want to give special thanks to uh, uh, Jason Kim, who did a tremendous amount of work on this on this book over the last uh, uh, year year and a quarter or so, and uh, we're very very pleased with it. And I should apologize right now for my. Uh, hay fever or flight cold, whatever it is. Um, let's see if this. <clears throat> what I'm going to try to do in a few moments is is just outline the uh, kind of the context, which I believe is familiar to most people in this room, perhaps not to everybody. So possibly this is a little bit of a refresher. <clears throat> but uh, as you know, President Obama came into office with the very strong uh, commitment forged during his Senate career and and uh, in the campaign to uh, to addressing climate change. Uh, the consensus of science is that we are in an era of global warming. I know that um, there are um, <clears throat> people who don't agree with that, and if you looked at the Washington Post on uh, on uh, Monday, uh, you'll see that the uh, Cato Institute uh, ran a contrary ad, and I suggest that you take a look at that if you think that there, there's a complete consensus because they are not, and they got some 60 or 70 scientists to sign up saying that um, that the science is is uh, is beyond dispute and the facts are not clear. That's their their message. We take it uh, in this study that uh, global warming is for real that the science is strong, uh, and um, while the debate is never closed, that's the uh, position on which we're going forward with this study and in which the political system is now going forward globally. So in the stimulus bill, uh, the President <coughs> and his colleagues put in quite a bit of money. It was about an $800 billion bill in rough terms, and uh, about $80 billion, about 10 percent of that, is related to the climate change issue, both the energy and, and the climate side, and two sides of the same coin. Uh, maybe 40 or 45 billion was uh, spending, another 20 billion in tax provisions. Uh, but uh, the, uh, I've seen comments from people in the administration who claim that there's as much as 80 billion in the bill, which has some relationship to, uh, to this issue. That, of course, is not the whole thing. There's, there's a promise for another $100 billion to be spent. Uh, but coming to the uh, <clears throat> pronouncements from the uh, President, he has talked about a, an economy-wide 100% auction system 
from the get-go when it's an enacted with uh, the two targets which are announced there of 14 percent below 2005 levels <clears throat> by 2020. And that would take us back to about the 1990 levels of U.S. emissions and 83 percent by 2050. The President has uh, not only his own very significant prestige, but uh, some quite strong hammers to, uh, to carry out these goals. And possibly the strongest is the EPA uh, power to uh, limit CO2, and I believe by implication from the Massachusetts case, all greenhouse gases in all industry. Now, of course, that would be done by regulation, not by uh, taxation. But that can be used, that power can be used as a hammer both domestically to help forge legislation and internationally. <clears throat> states have uh, been in the uh, forefront, or some states have been in the forefront of the uh, climate change, and they have adopted, uh, in some cases, quite stringent policies. And I might say that uh, uh, my colleague uh, Jeffrey Schott and uh, Mira Fickling are working on our next study, uh, also supported by, uh, kindly supported by the Dora Stoop Foundation and others, um, which will look at the regional and state level activities in this country, in Canada, and in Mexico. And there's a lot going on, but that was not the object of our study today. Now, <clears throat> but just a little more of a detour on that. Uh, when uh, President Obama went to uh, Canada, um, and you all remember the campaign on NAFTA and so forth, but the tone was completely different than the campaign, and out of that came a, a, a commitment to have a clean energy initiative with Canada, which after all is our biggest uh, energy supplier and probably our most secure supplier. An active role in Copenhagen, and during the campaign, the President put forward an idea of sort of a, a, a G10 type of group. The big emitters type of group is a rough steering uh, uh, group for, for Copenhagen that yes, yet has to be formed, but that was clearly in his mind. Uh, we've talked a lot, and um, Ambassador Stern has talked and others about the sequencing issue, and Fred has commented a great deal on this. Uh, the sequencing between domestic legislation and what happens in Copenhagen. And how that's done is, is going to be a very important part of the balance. Uh, we uh, intend to think it would be a mistake to carve any legislation in stone before Copenhagen, by which I mean make it very difficult to change the terms, um, because that would um, no doubt irritate other countries putting the U.S. in a take-it-or-leave-it position. But on the other hand, other countries do want to see the U.S. go forward because they are quite mindful of what happened to the Kyoto Protocol. And, you know, still significant resistance, especially during the uh, global uh, deep slump to any any effective U.S. measures. So it's, it's a balancing to go forward with those two. But remember, the President has that hammer I mentioned of the CO2 regulations where we're beginning to see, I think, uh, some initial installments. Already there was something on porch just the other day, and, and more, more will come forward. Um, and uh, I suppose the bottom line of this is that if, if there's nothing going on domestically at the time of the 2009 um, big meeting in Copenhagen, though nobody expects it to be wrapped up, I think, in 2009, but if there's nothing going on, that will take a lot of energy out of the uh, Copenhagen process. Today, um, and I guess Fred probably wired this, but uh, or just yesterday, uh, uh, Congressman Waxman and uh, Markey uh, released uh, at least draft provisions of their of their bill, so uh, they're going forward. And uh, and Waxman has said publicly that he wants to. Uh, get it out of the committee <clears throat> by Memorial Day, so he has an ambitious uh, target. Now, as you know, the Kyoto Protocol, which the United States never signed, expires in 2012. So there's some time between the 2009 Copenhagen Summit and uh, the 2012 expiration. So that leaves a little time for slippage. Our view uh, 
which may be too, uh, too cautious, is that given the size of the Copenhagen undertaking, it's uh, all countries, or essentially all countries, and the uh, controversy over the commitments, we think um, that uh, Copenhagen will be quite successful but reaches agreement on targets and time paths for national reduction of uh, greenhouse gases. Um, and there will have to be quite a bit of fudging, and that's why it's good to have a diplomat, diplomat like Stern or get Frank Roy here as an advisor to this to, to fudge over what are very different principles that are being brought to the table by, by parties. In the United States, I think it's reasonably fair to say that, that well, it's not phrased this way, our basic presumption is carbon price equivalency. And when I say carbon price, I mean CO2 equivalent, because there are a lot of greenhouse gases which are much more damaging than carbon per metric ton, but they're all folded into the process. So carbon price equivalency, which means that wherever carbon is emitted in the world, it ought to have the same burden uh, in terms of uh, either a permit process or an actual tax process or a performance standard to, to restrict its emission, because after all, and the after all is that new carbon going into the air will do equivalent damage, whether it's emitted in New Delhi or New York. <coughs> So that's, that's sort of the, the U.S. and the many industrial countries' supposition on how a system ought to evolve over time. Maybe not immediately, but over time that should be the, the, uh, the goal. Now, there are very different views on this, and the starkest contrast, I suppose, has been between that notion and per capita comparability, where the notion is that every person on the Earth has the same right to emit greenhouse gases. So the U.S. emits about 20 metric tons of CO2 equivalent a year, and uh, India, just to take an extreme at the other end, is about, uh, I think, about three metric tons, and China's in between, about five metric tons. So the argument there has been put forward that, well, it's all converged to the mean, uh, taking the average level of uh, everybody in the world, and so that maybe works out to the five, six metric tons a year, and that ought to be the obligation. And then there's a kind of a curve on that, which is to talk about historic responsibility, and uh, the Chinese have developed some numbers going back to roughly the beginning of the last century, and of course the industrial countries have much more historic responsibility for emissions than developing countries. Well, out of those three principles, there's no in a kind of obvious reconciliation, but that's what diplomats are for, to find a, a common ground. And uh, as I, I think most people are aware, if we look at the trajectory of future emissions, it's just dominated by the developing countries. <clears throat> the developed countries have somewhat flattened out their emissions trajectories, and the developing countries are still, with industrialization and higher standards of living, on a very rapid upward Trajectory, so you get extreme um, points on this. I mean, if, if the developed countries, uh, you know, absolutely froze and went back to 1990 levels, and you don't have uh, uh, some kind of comparable effort by the developing countries, it, it makes very little difference then in the uh, in the uh, level of greenhouse gases in, in in the atmosphere by the year 2050. <coughs> so. That, to reconcile all that is a big task, and our view in this book is that uh, maybe the Copenhagen will be successful in reaching reconciliation and uh, agreed time path and targets, but that each country will be given a lot of freedom to meet its own targets. And there will be some, some associated reforms, perhaps, of mechanisms developed in Kyoto, especially the clean development mechanism, which has been a considerable disappointment. Now, uh, this table is in the book on, on page five, if you're interested, and it kind of shows who's responsible in some of these numbers in terms of metric tons. We have other tables which take it down in terms of uh, uh, per capita. We show here in this table the kind of the sources and so forth. I suppose the big takeaway, and you can't read it, but coal is obviously a big source. 
and the uh, transportation and uh, electrical power uh, industries are, are, are big sources of, uh, of uh, CO2 um, emissions. And uh, this is a business as usual. Maybe there's a little more readable. You can sort of see the percentage changes projected over the next 25 years or so. Not much increase. There's some for the U.S. and Europe, but uh, China and some of the other developing countries, 2 3% a year. So that, that all adds up. Um, that's the business as usual where you don't have some type of pretty disciplined permitting standards. And let me just say a word about the discipline. There's more in the text, but uh, I've been talking with some uh, experts on uh, carbon capture and storage. And since coal is such a big source of power, about half in this country and uh, more than half in places like India and China, um, there's a lot of emphasis on the carbon capture and storage, for which the technology has been uh, is in its infancy. The Congressional Research Service has a good study, but probably too conservative. They say that to provide incentives for carbon capture and storage, you need a price of about $100 per metric ton. They've got a range, but that's sort of the middle. I've talked with some uh, in firms in this business, but I, I don't think I can really name them, or shouldn't name them, but they say the price is really $200 a metric ton to get, car to get carbon capture and storage with the kind of technologies which they see on the horizon, not just today, but what they can see over the horizon. So. That's so much above carbon permit prices that are contemplated now or you know, talked about and so on that you, you can see it's, it's, a, it's a major challenge. Now, <clears throat> turning to what is our concern, our principal concern, are these two L words, the leakage and leverage. And the leakage is that notion that, you know, you discipline industries here and if you don't have comparable discipline in, uh, especially in emerging countries, the industry will just go over there and the, the items will be produced and they will be exported, including back to the United States. And you won't have done anything except lose jobs here. That's putting it pretty starkly, but that's, that's a very strong congressional concern as, as Fred emphasized. The leverage is a little more subtle, but it's this other point that unless Big emerging countries, and they were on that earlier table. There are about you know ten countries which are dominant in, in emitting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Unless the big emerging countries join on, you know we're not really going to slow this trajectory from what is now about uh, you know 350 parts per million of CO2, and it's about 450 if you take all greenhouse gases up to the 550, 650 level in 2050, and uh, so we need to do something to inspire these countries to deal with their own transport, their own power sectors, and that's the leverage idea. And U.S. bills have included both these ideas somewhat um, mixed together, but those are uh, clearly key concerns. So what the U.S. has done, or many bills, um, and this is contemplated in the latest uh, Waxman draft, though I haven't read it, but I just saw a little, a little summary of it. Uh, but it's in about six bills, which we did survey in the book, six or eight. We have free allocation of allowances to, especially to sensitive industries. That means politically sensitive, uh, <laughs> but it also means industries which are internationally competitive. Kind of special exemptions for for sectors and you start right away with the auto sector. Nobody's talking about doing anything in terms of uh, gasoline permits um, for, I think, fairly transparent political reasons. And instead that would be addressed by some combination of technology and cafe type standards. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so big exemptions and then of course border adjustments. And when we look at legislation which has been either enacted or contemplated in other countries, it kind of goes along the similar similar lines. You have these same provisions to deal with um, the leakage and leverage problems. Border measures, this comes right down to the trading system. Um, 
these have a lot of political support. And uh, that second bullet, I'll just try to very quickly summarize, uh, goes, to, in my view, to the heart of the matter. And the way I put it is this. With the exception of the United States, nearly every other country of any significance has a value-added tax system. Now, economists have written, you know, lots and lots of articles and published books with the core argument that you don't need to adjust the value-added tax system at the border because the exchange rate or the price system will do it for you. So why, why, why adjust at the border? Uh, and, you know, the wonderful mathematics you can do on that and prove it to your heart's content, or at least to your graduate student's content. And the, um, the practical result is that every country that I know of, I'm sure there's an exception, but every country that I know of that has a value-added tax adjusts it at the border. That is, it remits the tax on exports and imposes the tax on imports. That's the so-called destination principle. The opposite principle, which is beloved by at least some economists, is the origin principle, where you impose the tax on anything produced in your borders, so it's on the exports, and you don't impose it on the imports. The origin principle has not found favor under value-added tax systems. Now, similarly, in the, in the climate debate, we have uh, books such as the one that Fred mentioned, which is published by this institute, Leveling the Carbon Playing Field, and much else, which purports to show that you don't need to adjust it at the border. You don't need to have much of an adjustment because um, the impact is limited to a very few industries, and the mobility of those industries is very low, and you won't get this leakage problem, which I mentioned earlier. And it's really kind of a problem in your mind, not a problem in the world. So that's the, the thrust of that literature. Uh, the political sale on that literature is zero. It's not, not accepted. So we, we are thinking that legislation coming forward will have some border adjustments here and in other countries. But then we are quick to point out that border measures can be imposed on the United States as well. Uh, so you can, you know, no one country is limited to this, and as I mentioned, Australia and European Union are well along in this, in their legislation. And the fact of the matter is that when you look at the statistics on emissions per capita, um, the United States is right at the top of the list. So what that means is that the United States is potentially exposed to uh, border measures by other countries. And we might think, oh, we're going to be insulated because we're going to have a very zero carbon or low, not zero carbon, low carbon emitting cement industry or steel or chemicals. There are about six or eight industries which are high carbon emitters, and we're going to do a good job on those. So who would want to border adjust against us? Well, to be very clear, maybe not Canada or the European Union because we have a lot of other ties, but some country which really feels that the world is unfair, and uh, our country emits three metric tons per year, and you guys emit 18 or 20 metric tons per year per capita. And so what we're going to do is count, when we do our border adjustment, we're going to count all that uh, emissions that take place when your workers commute back and forth using their SUVs and, you know, your whole style of life and so forth. We're going to have a much big, broader count when we do our border adjustments. And, you know, it's, they can spin out that argument. Um, so that's one point we, we make in, as we are kind of rushing forward in this border adjustment uh, <coughs> spirit. The other is that it's hard to see that border measures by themselves. We just confine it to something akin to what's done on the VAT and other tax systems, but particularly the VAT. The amount of our imports from places like China and India of carbon-intensive goods, so I'm back to the cement, the steel, and so forth, it's not trivial, but it's rather small, and the statistics are in the, are in the book. So it doesn't seem like it adds up to the leverage, which is the other abiding concern in the United States. Um, and so if you're really going to talk about leverage, you probably have to go into other domains 
which are, you know, further away from the classic border adjustment type of principles. And um, of course, a big point of our book is that border measures stand a, a good chance of being uh, challenged by the WTO. Um, and I don't want to spend much time on this because this is uh, Steve's special province, but um, both the import restrictions and export could be challenged. And so the our bottom line is uh, whether there can be some linkage between future WTO negotiations in this area and what's going on in Copenhagen. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon. Uh, let me just start by saying it's a, it's a great honor uh, to be here and to follow uh, Fred Berkson and uh, Gary Huffbauer up here, two people that I've known for over 30 years who are uh, great inspirations in my work on trade and in, in my career. Um, the goals of the project have been to, uh, are to explain the trade dimension of climate policy, to explicate WTO and identify potential conflicts, and to propose solutions uh, to the looming uh, collisions between trade and environment. Uh, Gary has mentioned uh, the ways in which trade and, and climate interact, the competitiveness, uh, carbon leakage, and the idea of, of leverage against free riders. I want to talk about those terms just for a moment. Uh, with regard to competitiveness, one can think about sector or industry, and that's typically the way uh, people have discussed competitiveness in this climate debate, what's going to happen to chemicals or steel or, or something like that. Uh, there's also, and we, and we talk about it in the book a little bit, economy-wide measures of competitiveness. Uh, what's the effect of the change in policy on, say, the United States, our ability to, to grow our economy, investment, and jobs? And in thinking about um, competitiveness, one should uh, never lose sight of the um, get rid of this. Uh, never lose sight of the um, of the, the counterfactual. I mean, if you don't do a policy, what will be the impact on competitiveness if we have a uh, tremendous amount of uh, temperature in increase in climate change? Uh, now, leakage um, is a puzzling term, and uh, there are three concepts really in play in, in the current debate about leakage. One is, is just the, the outward movement of investment or production to, to less regulated countries. Uh, Chairman Levin of the Subcommittee on Ways and Means the other day referred to this as job leakage. Um, another definition relates to the amount of emission reduction we lose uh, in the United States and affect the erosion of our emission reduction. Uh, when there's been a movement of industry to other countries like China and they have greater emissions as a result of that uh, movement of industry, movement of investment. Um, the third definition, one that we, we talk about in the book a bit and, and focus on with respect to the WTO analysis, is leakage as incoherence. In other words, if you have a climate regime and there are major emitters who are not part of, of, of the regime, they don't have uh, uh, caps, they haven't committed to making large uh, reductions, then the whole regime is somewhat incoherent and cannot achieve its, its purpose. So uh, in the economic measures of leakage, one analyzes it in terms of loss of production or loss of uh, movement of GDP to another country, whereas uh, for uh, leakage as environmental incoherence, it's, it's a, uh, a greenhouse gas metric. Now, I would uh, submit that the, uh, how one uses the term leakage really matters in terms of trade law. This is not just a question of semantics. And we, we make the point in the book that competitiveness, the argument about competitiveness we hear all the time, is not going to be a valid rationale in the World Trade Organization to claim an environmental exception. And the same for, for job leakage. But the idea of the incoherence of the regime, that if the United States, the EU, and other countries uh, move toward sizable uh, reductions, but there are a few countries, major countries, that don't, that that leaves the regime somewhat unworkable. And that, we submit, is a good justification under WTO law 
for invoking the environmental exception in GATT Article 20. Chapter 2 of the book uh, goes through WTO law in detail, and we cover um, these agreements, the GATT, the Subsidies Agreement, the TBT Agreement, and attempt to, to analyze these, these rules in detail, look at all the case law that's relevant through 2008. WTO law moves very quickly. There are new cases all the time, but the book was certainly current as of the end of last year. With respect to the GATT rules, uh, these are the ones that are most important. Article 1, most favored nation, it is discrimination between foreign countries. Article 2, uh, which regulates tariff concessions and also border adjustments. Article 3, national treatment, don't discriminate, don't discriminate against the imported product uh, relative to the domestic-like product. And the general exceptions in Article 20 for uh, conservation of exhaustible natural resources in Article 20G and Article 20B on, on human, plant, uh, animal, or plant life for health. We, we focus mainly on Article 20G because we think that would be the provision that would be most likely invoked in a uh, climate dispute at the WTO. One, one thing to, to think about with respect to Article 2 versus Article 3 is that Article 2 deals with border measures, customs duties, import charges, and border adjustments whereas Article 3 of the GATT deals with internal measures. So the distinction is border measures versus internal measures like regulations and taxes. And how you classify a, a climate trade measure, uh, whether it's an Article 2 border measure or an Article 3 internal measure, will then have a, a major impact on whether it's legal under the, the rules of the, of the GATT. If there's a violation of Article 1, Article 2, or, or Article 3 of the GATT, then uh, the defending country in a WTO dispute does have recourse to Article 20, the general exceptions. And the, the outline of, of Article 20 is that there's this chapeau at the top that prohibits arbitrary or unjustifiable discrimination or disguised restriction of international trade in the way that the measure is carried out and then contains a list of policy purposes under Article 20 that can justify invocation of the exception. And this is the uh, Article 20G exception on uh, conservation of exhaustible natural resources. Uh, and we, we talk about, for, for Article 20, all of the case law on, on Article 20, the gasoline case, the, the shrimp case, the, the tires case, etc. The book also covers WTO rules on subsidies. And uh, this is the subsidies agreement, Article 1 and 2, the definition of the subsidy, the definition of, of specificity of a subsidy, uh, Article 3, which the rule uh, prohibiting certain kinds of subsidies, export subsidies and domestic content subsidies. Article 5, outlaws what are called actionable subsidies that cause adverse effects to other WTO members. And then there was an Article 8, that provided for certain non-actionable subsidies, including subsidies for the environment, but that provision uh, expired in 1999. All right, now chapter three of the book, uh, having gone through the WTO rules, explained how they work, looked at the case law, chapter three uh, examines hypothetical or proposed uh, measures that uh, where there's a climate trade uh, interaction um, and just, uh, tries to analyze whether they would be legal or, or illegal under World Trade Organization law, depending on the exact measure used. And so we go through uh, in, in, in several sections, and these are, these are some of them, there were a few others, where we look at different kinds of measures, uh, carbon tariffs, charges on imports, an internal tax, uh, internal carbon tax that applied equally to the import to the domestic product, the export rebate on an, an emission allowance. If you if you uh, if you have an emission allowance and then export, you can get a rebate. Performance standards on products that relate to the carbon footprint of that product. Subsidies to affected industries, uh, which Gary talked about. Uh, trade sanctions and a few others. So there's, there are detailed sections in the book that talk about each of those measures. Let me mention a few of them here. 
um, carbon measures on imports. Well, one conclusion from the case law is that if you impose some domestic climate measure and it has regulatory costs on the producers in, your, in the United States economy, say, you cannot offset that cost of environmental regulation directly by imposing taxes on imports. Uh, that's clear under, under Article 3. But there are more subtle ways of, of attempting to do something. Uh, and it depends, and the rule will depend with respect to a carbon measure on an import, whether it's a border measure or an internal measure that applies to both domestic products and imports. The issue on, on border measures is whether you can do a border adjustment on charges for energy or charges for pollution in, that, that occur in a foreign country. And we analyze that issue in the book. The key legal issue for the internal measures is whether uh, you can d d determine whether something is a like product. The import and the domestic product are like, and therefore the national treatment rule would apply, prohibiting discrimination. But whether uh, the carbon footprint of a product is a factor in ascertaining its likeness. And uh, we talk about the, juris the jurisprudence there. Um, I think the answer to the, the, the question of the, of the border charges is, is possibly uh, with respect to um, the, the carbon footprint, probably not, as the way we understand like product, it wouldn't matter how the product is made, but it's, it's still an open question. It has never been adjudicated in the GATT or the WTO. We suggest in the book some possible policy space that's been overlooked a little in the debate, which is this GATT Article 2 with respect to border adjustments. And it, it does allow a border adjustment for a charge on an import equivalent to an internal tax in respect of an article which has been from which the imported product has been manufactured or produced in whole or in part. In other words, you can, you can put a, a charge on an um, imported product based on some uh, domestic uh, taxes on inputs that are part of that imported product. The key legal question is whether um, the, the, the input from the foreign manufacturing process has to be physically incorporated into the imported product or could be something that was simply used in the production of that imported product such as uh, energy. And we suggest that there is some scope in this provision to do a, a, a border charge related to articles used in foreign productions, for example, coal, uh, and, that, and you could base that perhaps on a certificate that accompanies a product saying how much coal was used in the upstream process. So we think there is some possible policy space under that uh, provision. With respect to performance standards, that's a, a regulation saying what the carbon footprint of a product has to be to be, say, sold in the U.S. market, there would be an analysis under Article 3 on discrimination and possibly recourse to, to Article 20. We also talk about the technical barriers to trade agreement because if you're dealing with a standard or regulation on a product, it also invokes the, the TBT agreement. And there's a, an unresolved question there whether the TBT agreement applies to regulations related to the processing or manufacture of the product as opposed to product standards about the, the product itself, its weight or uh, uh, effect on the user of the product. That issue was not resolved. At the time the TBT agreement was negotiated, I think it was thought that it would not apply to so-called PPMs, standards related to the processing of a product. But the jurisprudence of the WTO has been very text-oriented. Not, uh, has not always decided things based on the intent of the negotiators. And so we think there's still, that's an unresolved question. Indeed, we suggest in the book that if it came to litigation, probably it would be determined that the TBT agreement applied to those kinds of regulations too. There's a new WTO case against the United States being filed by Mexico. It's a new version of, this, of the Tuna Dolphin case 
that occurred in the early 90s. And Mexico has suggested that the U.S. labeling standard violates the TVT agreement. So there may be some jurisprudence coming in the WTO about the scope of the TVT agreement that will be out before climate measures perhaps are challenged. Okay, cap and trade. It implicates WTO rules in several ways with respect to imports and exports. If you have a requirement that an importer purchase some emission allowances in a cap and trade system, which most of the proposals do have, there would be this question I alluded to earlier, whether it's an import charge or an internal regulation. Clearly, if in your cap and trade system you treat imports from different countries different, you allow the imports from the EU, but you don't, say, from China, you require the ones from China to purchase the allowance, but not the ones from the EU, that's going to be a violation of the MFN obligation. We also spend a lot of time talking about subsidies and how they would govern emission allowances. And there's an interesting question, is the free allocation of an emission allowance, something we hear a lot about in Washington these days, is that a subsidy under the subsidies agreement? Well, no case law on that, so no black letter law. But we say that if you really just had pure grandfathering, you allow certain emitters, historic emitters, to continue emitting, that's not a subsidy. The lack of a regulation is not a subsidy. And phasing in a new regulation, I think, is not a subsidy. But we argue that if you give a free allowance to certain companies within a system where other companies are paying for it, that that's a subsidy. And the definition of subsidy, and it's a complicated one, but I only quote part of it here, if government revenue that is otherwise due is foregone, that's a subsidy if there's a benefit to the recipient. And here we think there would be a benefit. So we analyze that issue, and that if free allocation of allowances is a subsidy, it would be subject to the rules of the SCM agreement that I mentioned earlier. All right, we spend a multiple page, about 12 pages or so, I think, analyzing the Boxer-Lieberman-Warner Climate Act. And we'll call it Boxer for the purposes of this presentation. And this was a cap-and-trade system, large initial allocation of emission allowances. The importer has to purchase an international reserve allowance, except for imports from countries that are taking comparable action, and you wouldn't have to purchase it for imports from least developed countries. There's a rebate of an emission allowance on export. So we try to analyze these provisions in the Boxer bill. Are they consistent with the WTO? It's the question we analyze. Well, it's not an internal measure. It's an import charge, and it would therefore be a violation of Article 2 because it's not in the schedule. It's a new measure. The discrimination based on the greenhouse gas intensity between countries or their programs is going to violate Article 1, but there would be a possible recourse to the GATT environmental exception. The authors of this bill, I think, went to a great deal of effort to try to use the Shrimp decision, which is the leading decision in the WTO on the availability of GATT Article 20G. They used that as the guidepost for writing the Boxer bill, and to some extent it works. So I think the overall idea that one could impose a charge on another country because it did not have a comparable climate program to the United States, I think that works in general under the exception in Article 20. We do caution, though, that just because there was this important Shrimp decision that validated the U.S. import ban on shrimp may not necessarily hold for a case with respect to climate, which would be vastly more trade than was involved in shrimp. With respect, though, to our detailed analysis of the Boxer provisions, we conclude that although it does fit within the purpose of Article 20, it's close, but it doesn't really make it, that there's so many aspects of it that violate the terms of the Article 20 chapter. First, we note that you would have to challenge it as applied. 
um, and therefore you wouldn't be able to challenge it until there had been decisions under it. And under the, the way the bill is written, the administrators have a great deal of discretion in how many import res reserve allowances they require for a particular import for a particular sector in a particular country. A great deal of discretion. So you really wouldn't know in advance how that discretion was being carried out. But a number of features in the way the legislation was written uh, to us showed unjustifiable or arbitrary discrimination or possibly a disguised restriction on international trade. Therefore, it would violate the chapeau. Therefore, it would not be allowed in our uh, uh, suggestion of how a WTO panel would deal with it. Uh, just to mention a couple of things, the, the uh, lack of a baseline for clean energy products, say from China. China would be treated as a, a whole country or, or one sector in that country would be treated as a whole. But if there's an import from a plant in China that use, has totally uh, zero carbon footprint on that production, they wouldn't get credit for that. Also, the draft of this uh, amendment last year, and I think it'll be more cleverly written this year, but last year when it was written up, the whole title with respect to the import measures was called Promoting Fairness While Reducing Emissions. And the idea of, of fairness, I think, can be uh, perhaps problematic in an analysis under, under Article 20. We also look at the subsidy rules um, and um, suggest that the rebate of an emission allowance on export is a violation uh, and that the grant of the free emission allowance is under the Boxer Bill uh, because they're tradable emission allowances would certainly be a, a subsidy under the, the WTO agreement and we'd have to analyze to see whether it caused uh, adverse effects to other countries. Let me note though that, that free allocation of emission allowances is, is a feature of, of the approach of many countries. Uh, Australia just announced one for free allowances for emission intensive trade exposed industry. So if the free allowance is a subsidy, then it may very well have adverse effects on other countries because it's intended to uh, help the Australian industry. Um, and we analyzed the, the energy tax on export, looking closely at the uh, subsidy agreement provisions. We take note that um, the conventional wisdom is that energy taxes or pollution taxes are not indirect taxes therefore are not entitled to be rebated on export. But we note that there are some new provisions in the agreement, this footnote 61 of the subsidy agreement, that may provide greater policy space than has generally been recognized. And uh, we discuss the possibility that indirect taxes now include energy taxes, uh, energy used in the production process. Okay, uh, chapters four and five have, have detailed policy recommendations. And um, uh, here they are, uh, and I'll, I'll discuss them in more quickly in more detail. Um, first, we say it's important to avoid WTO disputes. Just don't bring big climate cases to the WTO, if at all possible. It's not going to be a good thing for the WTO or for the climate regime. The cases would take years. There'd be a great deal of uncertainty, regardless of what happens before the WTO panels to leave many unhappy countries. Uh, political stress on the WTO, regardless whether a particular measure is upheld or struck down. If a case is brought against the United States and we lose, we probably wouldn't implement it or might not implement it. And non-implementation can also be very bad for the WTO. So our goal was to try to keep these things out of WTO dispute settlement. We discussed the possibility of using the WTO to negotiate on climate. and. Uh, the idea of a, of a WTO code, which we, we think is a, it would be a good thing for the WTO to consider, a code on, on climate uh, related, uh, you know, trade measures related to climate, um, but it would be unlikely given the consensus rule in the WTO. Should climate be added to the Doha agenda? Would that help? We, we talk about that. Uh, and a couple of other ideas that have been discussed in the debate, we, we go through of ways the WTO could contribute, and in the point that Fred made earlier, is a way that there could be synergy between the regimes. And so we, we at least analyzed some of the ideas that had been proposed. Uh, also, to follow up what, what Gary said, what can be done in the forthcoming COP15 in Copenhagen? 
Uh, we suggest in the book that if there was, I mean, one possibility might be an agreement on uh, caps by developing countries in exchange for an agreement by the United States and other major countries not to impose unilateral trade measures uh, for a period of time. We also talk about the idea of non-binding principles uh, for the use of trade measures on climate change, something that could be articulated by the environment regime in Copenhagen. And then, as Pascal Ami, the WTO Director General, has said, what the climate regime does could be imported into the WTO and to, could give a signal to the WTO. And so we think that is a, a possibility. We call in the book for a moratorium on the use of climate border measures on internal products that would last for three years and would give time for negotiations between countries with regard to the imposition of, of, of trade measures. In the absence of some sort of moratorium, these measures could be enacted this year and, and lead to a great deal of disruption in trade and the disputes at the WTO that we try to avoid. Uh, and finally, we propose a code of good WTO practice. So this would not be a, an official code within the WTO because that would require um, consensus, but rather a code outside the WTO of like-minded countries. Could it be done? Well, it's possible you could get a critical mass of countries, major economies that are also the major emitters, to get together and agree uh, to a code. Um, the code would not affect the rights and obligations of, of governments that are not in the code under the WTO, but it could lead to agreement among those uh, countries that join it, and um, uh, they would then agree under this code to a peace clause uh, not to challenge the climate measures of other countries so long as they conform to the provisions of the code. Uh, we discussed the code in the last chapter. Let me just mention a few of the, our suggestions for what it might uh, contain. Um, because of the likelihood that free admission allowances would be viewed to be a subsidy and therefore come under, under WTO rules and could lead to a violation, we suggest that among these like-minded countries uh, that admission permits given away freely won't be considered subsidies, so you won't bring a case against that. We prefer options, but recognize that some permits could be given out for free. Um, we suggest that for exported product, there be no rebate at the border for a uh, emission allowances, that the producer of the product maintain uh, that responsibility. There's no environmental reason to, to give a rebate at the border when you export a product for which you've uh, paid for an emission allowance. We say that it would be okay for the countries in the code to impose comparability uh, provisions uh, on each other and to use import measures if one country has a higher, uh, uh, more rigorous cap than, than the other. But this would be a mutually agreed upon procedure among the, the countries in the code. Uh, also, we suggest that there be policy space for clean energy subsidies, which under the current SCM agreement can be attacked as a subsidy. Some of them would not be specific, but some of them could very well be specific and therefore could be challenged. And that the code could also prohibit certain climate harmful subsidies, such as deforestation subsidies. So here are our overall conclusions. Uh, WTO rules do impose constraints, legal constraints, on the design of, of trade-related climate measures. Uh, it's possible to do things consistent with GATT Article 20 with respect to import uh, charges. But as Gary noted, uh, what works for the United States could also work for other countries and could lead to dueling uh, import charges on uh, each other's trade, which would not be a good thing for world trade and therefore would not be a good thing for the world economy. And, and finally, there has been an assumption in this debate, you can, you can see it in a lot of the, the legislative proposals as well as the governmental proposals, that um, climate subsidies are not going to implicate the WTO subsidies agreement. Uh, we think that uh, assumption is, is, is unwarranted and that policymakers need to pay closer attention to the WTO subsidy rules. Thank you.